Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Great to see so many new faces. And uh, welcome to this session of our online community conversation series entitled Hope and Delusion, Critical Storytelling for Difficult Times. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone of a couple of Zoom rules. I'll be very brief. Um, the first one is that we ask participants to turn off their microphone uh, during the presentation, just to ensure a better quality audio. Uh, for this reason, we may mute you if we hear any background noise. Um, but if during the Q&A discussion, if you want to ask a question, you can either use the uh, raise your hand function on Zoom, which can be can be found in the uh, reactions at the bottom of your screen, or you can physically raise your hand and if we spot you, um, I'll call you out and you can ask your question. Um, otherwise, you can use the chat section to ask your question if you're feeling a bit shy. Um, feel free to use the uh, chat throughout the session as it's a great way to uh, share your thoughts and insights uh, during this session. Um, we also invite everyone to turn on their cameras as we believe it creates a nice educational environment, seeing everyone's faces and reactions. But if you don't feel comfortable doing so, feel free to just keep it off. And finally, all sessions are recorded, uh, both for archival purposes, but also for all of you. Uh, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel uh, by the end of next week, and it will be available to all, so feel free to share. All right, so enough about rules, we can start with our event. Uh, today we welcome Robert Norris. Uh, he's an independent researcher and trainee union analyst based in Zurich, Switzerland. Robert has traveled all over the world um, and has a wide range of interests, including linguistics, philology, permaculture design, and even has a black belt in Aikido. Um, so today, Robert will have his presentation followed by Q&A. Uh, in this session, um, Robert will focus on hope and delusion and our relation to these when confronted to, with a period of crisis. Now, this past year, I believe, can be described as such period. A period of crisis filled with uncertainty about the future. Most of us have been trying to cling to our own hopes, whether it was hoping to hoping for everything to go back to normal, uh, hoping to see your loved ones, hug them, or even sit down, have an introspection and pray. Hope has definitely been a prevalent aspect of this past year, which maybe we don't hear much on the news or on the media. So today we welcome Robert to talk us through hope and delusion. Over to you, Robert, welcome. Okay, thank you, James. And thank you all for coming. Such a, such a pleasure to see everybody here. Uh, so many faces, uh, so many well-known faces too. <laughs> it's, it's really nice. Um, uh, so thank you also to, to the Party Center for um, its commitment to bringing everybody together like this. It's a real um, gift. Um, so you know, a lot of appreciation to you for that. Um, at this, uh, this opening, <laughs> of a talk um, in meditation circles often is the moment when we sort of, we gather together, we settle down and uh, we take a moment to, uh, to be um, quietly together. Um, I'll leave that up to you. Um, I'm going to uh, keep talking, but uh, this um, first few observations I'm going to make will be um, by way of allowing everybody to settle down and to um, you know, arrive, if you like. In particular, I think um, I would like to just um, acknowledge a few things. The first thing I'd like to acknowledge is um, the fact that we are here and the choice that we all have in being here. Um, it seems that choice and choicelessness seem, is, uh, has become a real uh, theme, a real issue for many of us in the last year and a half. And you know, with our social media, uh, resources. Um, uh, we are allowed, in a way, to be here freely of our own free will. And this is a really, really important point. I think it's something that, uh, uh, for me personally, is, uh, is um, vitally important to acknowledge. I would also um, go on from that to say that even though social, uh, social media, again, talking from my perspective, has, uh, has been a bit of a um, a bit of an issue for me um, in the last year or so. Um, 
us being here together to share something like this, to, to share ideas about uh, what it means to, to be alive, uh, perhaps to uh, gain some insights um, into various aspects of our experience. Um, and to, you know, just sort of um, come together like this, even though we don't know each other, um, I would suggest is a wise use of resources. It's a wise use of time and it's a wise use of resources. In these times, we really do need to um, think about how we use these resources, um, especially since you know, there's so much fear um, that comes through social media, so much fear of um, you know, what's happening in the world. Um, and also, uh, to be honest, the fear of the unknown in the sense that, uh, that there is a, a widespread fear of how the technology that we are employing here tonight um, might be used against us in some way. Um, whether that's a rational fear or not, I don't really know. Um, in a different lifetime, maybe I might become <laughs> an expert on, te on technology and the way it's used. It's just, a, but that irrational fear, if it is an, ir an irrational fear, is definitely there. In Buddhism, um, this um, acknowledgement, this acknowledgement of the fact that um, we are here and we are free to make a wise choice about how we use our resources um, is a very important step. It's a very important step towards um, reassessing our relationship with suffering, actually. Maybe if we look at this from the point of view of uh, Western philosophy, um, what we are looking at is that old chestnut, the question about freedom and determination. Um, it's a question that, that I might come back to in a minute, but um, I think primarily here, what I would like to focus our attention on tonight um, is that this question itself, <clears throat> are we free or are we determined, in my view, actually is a non-question. It's much more interesting to think about whether we are victims or agents. So I would like to um, start us off um, with a little uh, word association game. Um, I'm going to put a question to you and I'm gonna ask for your responses to this question. Now, I'd like you to write a single word. In other words, I'm going to ask you a question and I would like to uh, invite you to use the chat to write a single word that comes up in response to the question. If nothing comes up, then I would invite you to acknowledge that and appreciate that fact. This is not about performance. We're not here to achieve anything. Um, we're just here to tap into our experience. The experience of not having an answer the experience of not knowing what to say and the permission that we give ourselves to actually say, well, that's okay. What I have to offer right now is nothing. So you can write nothing in the chat if that's what you want to do, or you can just say nothing, write nothing. <laughs> um, I'll leave that to you, okay? So the question I'm, uh, I would like to ask you very simply is, what comes up for you when you think about the word hope? And you can use different languages too. You don't have to write it in English. This is amazing. Well, that was actually very, very interesting. That was way beyond my expectations. Um, interesting that um, you get pretty much a, a, the, the full range of experience there from um, despair to I don't value hope much to ocean, butterflies, and possibility. 
this is really what we're talking about tonight. When we talk about hope and denial reality as well, when we talk about hope, we're talking about a vast range of human experience. And I think that in itself is uh, worth looking into and understanding a bit more closely. So why are we here this evening? I mean, it's, uh, I, I, it's just an amazing thing, as I said earlier, to be here to talk about hope on a Sunday evening. Um, but my feeling is, and I, this is a, a reflection that came from uh, a, a blog post I, wrote, I read just yesterday. Um, a beloved meditation teacher writing about um, the fact that uh, in the United States, um, and if there are any people in the United States who can correct me here, but the um, scientific advisory body um, uh, has decreed that uh, social distancing and masks are no longer necessary. Uh, I hope I'm correct in saying that. That's what I um, understood. Whereas in Britain, the exact opposite is the case. You know, people are being vaccinated, but still social distancing and masks are necessary. So who do we believe? I think the problem that we are beset with is that we are facing so many alternatives, so many uh, conundrums, dilemmas, which way to go, who to believe, what to, what to listen to. In symbolic terms, you might say this is the, the, the trickster at play. This is the, uh, the old, uh, our old friend, the trickster, um, showing us different realities and saying both are true. So, so much appears um, to hinge on whether or not we have a choice. But I would suggest actually that what uh, is really valuable here is um, whether we think we have a choice. And if we think we have a choice, how do we use that choice? If we think we don't have a choice, then the question I might invite you to um, think about while we go through this talk is at what point in your experience do you feel you lose the power of choice? Of course, and I'm sure that many people will um, sort of re resonate with this, there are plenty of situations out there and we, 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 we hear about them frequently um, uh, now as well. There are plenty of uh, situations where um, the question of choice and choicelessness becomes a very, very questionable question. <laughs> um, I was just listening recently to a podcast episode, um, Jack Blanchard, a uh, British journalist, uh, and his podcast, Westminster Insider, doing a, a report on um, the situation with victims of um, abuse, um, domestic violence, psychological violence at home during lockdown, people who are unable actually to leave home because if they do, they get fined or even worse, arrested perhaps in some cases. So um, how do we talk about hope and choice when we are talking about people like this who are locked at home with abusive members of their families? How do we do that? Another um, situation, another mm, category, if you like, of um, problem. Something that I had to deal with uh, um, some years ago for a few months with a friend of mine. We were looking into the question of the refugee crisis, in particular, uh, the arrival of refugees at uh, Calais in northern France. These are people who have been traveling often for years to get to northern France. Um, people who have frequently, in many cases, been moved from torture camp to torture camp in Africa before even they get to the boats in the Mediterranean. Who get sold on to traffic to traffickers, to, um, people traffickers. And then when they get to Calais in northern France, uh, they end up being beaten up by the police and chased by police dogs and persecuted by the locals. So, I mean, if we want to look at it from that point of view for the moment, how do we talk about hope? How do we talk about choice with these people? I don't really have any answers to that, to these particular social problems. These are social problems, and I'm, I'm really not um, qualified to 
to uh, talk at any great length about them. Um, but I would say that it takes a lot of courage to face alternatives. It takes a lot of courage to face up to our, um, our dilemmas in life. And this is a question of compassion, not one of judgment. Um, compassion that we can all find, perhaps. Because, I mean, in the end, we're all born amateurs and um, we're all kind of more or less alone with our experience. I think the important thing that I would like to stress here is that um, this narrative of aloneness is not the whole story. And I think this is where really where um, hope begins to trickle in, if you like. So the narrative of aloneness is not the whole story. It's a result of dualistic thinking, where I say, um, this is my experience. I cannot know anything beyond this, even though I know that there may be something else, but this is my experience. What I'm trying to look for, perhaps, um, is a way to encourage integrative thinking. So where I see that there's my side of the story and there is the other side of the story and that the other side of the story perhaps contains a possibility. And I think, and I hear, I'll just um, refer quickly to um, you know, my wife's work. She, she helps many women um, in their personal dilemmas in life. And one thing that uh, she you know, said to me just the other day was how difficult it is for people to ask for help. When we look at the other side of the story, when we acknowledge, again, this, this um, question of acknowledging, which is a really important first step, when we acknowledge that beyond what we are experiencing, there is perhaps another side of the story, then maybe we can actually also acknowledge that help is there to be found as well. There is a helping hand somewhere for us to find. <clears throat> to find. There's a great power in um, knowing how to ask for help, and I should know because I'm not very good at it. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I think, again, um, the experience of my wife and the work that she does with her clients um, has opened my eyes to this fact that the power of help is a truly restorative and healing power, which we can all tap into. So um, I would suggest that when we are talking about the power of help. What we're actually talking about is um, a capacity that we may have to enter into dialogue with mystery. Of course, what we know often is what is hurting us. What we don't know is what can help us. That capacity to enter into dialogue with mystery, that's where the courage is. <laughs> um, is entering into dialogue with what we don't know. And I think the, the juxtaposition between uh, problem and mystery, which is something I've just taken from uh, the Christian existentialist philosopher, Gabriel Marcel, um, is an important one to bear in mind, especially when we're talking about hope. Are we talking about hope for something? Or are we, just talk or act or are we actually talking about something which is deeply embedded in human experience, which allows us to um, confront problems and dilemmas. So we have this problem of dualities and um, there are plenty of other um, dualities which have <laughs> come up at, um, in the last few weeks in my sort of reading around, uh, around hope. And um, so we mentioned free will and determinism, which is uh, basically entry level philosophy. And I have to say at this point, um, it's my uh, experience of uh, uh, the, uh, studying free will and determinism at school was, uh, uh, sorry, at school, and not school, yeah, at university. Um, it left me with a feeling that um, uh, these philosophical conundrums um, reinforce the perception that um, life is just one long series of irresolvable problems. Um, and I, again, as I mentioned earlier, I do think that these questions, such as free will and determinism, are false questions. They're not really the questions we should be asking. 
another um, dualism which uh, came, has come up in my uh, reading recently is um, something which came up in Viktor Frankl. Um, reading Viktor Frankl's uh, well, well, famous book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, and his observation of human experience stripped down to the barest of bones possible um, in the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And the basic distinction he made between decent and indecent. Now, um, what he means by that is um, people and how they respond to the situations. And fair enough, there were people who became brutalized by their experiences. But he observed also that there are a lot of people who um, held on to their dignity. And I think this is an interesting point. Um, even for us now, we're not perhaps um, experiencing quite the same level of extremity um, as Viktor Frankl experienced. But I think there are lessons to be learned there. Um, another juxtaposition which came up for me, and this is perhaps probably the strongest kind of uh, impulse for me to actually come and, and talk to you about hope uh, this evening, was um, the difference between useful and unuseful. In other words, is hope useful? <laughs> this is a question that uh, um, it crops up in, in many circles, in my experience anyway, uh, primarily uh, Buddhist circles, um, uh, but also I have it on good authority uh, that um, uh, it was already um, uh, um, a question for the, the Stoic philosophers in ancient Rome, so people like Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. So is hope a useful concept? Um, does, it, does hope actually help us in our day-to-day uh, -day struggles? Now, as you will find, uh, this, throughout this talk, Viktor Frankl actually features quite prominently. That was unexpected for me. I, I came to him quite late. But in a way, his voice has, uh, has come into my narrative quite powerfully. And um, there's one thing that I, um, I can say about Viktor Frankl is that for him, hope really is fundamental. So um, for him, hope is actually key to survival. It is a flame that we work to keep alive. Um, and without it, quite simply, we don't make it, we die. And um, so actually, I can, I would just like to quickly read a little um, quote from him, from his book. Um, we had to learn ourselves, and furthermore, we had to teach the despairing men that it did not really matter what we expected from life, but rather what life expected from us. And there's a very famous uh, anecdote uh, about him where a group of prisoners were going to uh, throw themselves against the electric fencing to uh, end their lives. Um, and he said to them, um, you know, it's not about what you expect from life, it's about what life expects from you. I don't know exactly whether that saved them, but the point was very, very clear, it seems to me. So, um, the question of hope is highly problematic, and I understand that, even though my position is actually very much in line with uh, what Viktor Frankl is saying. I'm, I'm a great sort of believer in, in hope and the importance of hope, and which is kind of why I'm here, really. Um, the uh, condition we, we, we find ourselves in um, is a very challenging condition, often. And uh, one person, I think, who kind of illustrates this fact is Albert Camus. Um, and um, Albert Camus, in 1942, published his uh, uh, The Myth of Sisyphus, a philosophical essay, in which um, he elaborates the, his philosophy of the absurd. Um, essentially, he sees <clears throat> life as being absurd, meaning that human beings have an um, irrepressible need to find meaning in their lives. Um, but they are only ever met with what he calls this sort of unreasonable silence of the universe. So this is the absurdity at the heart of human life. And for him, <laughs> I mean, I like to call uh, um, Sisyphus Albert Camus' uh, idea of a happy human. Um, because in Albert Camus' 
mind the um, this king, this king of Ephira, um, ancient Corinth, who cheated death twice and was punished with this uh, boulder which he had to push up to the top of the hill and which fell down um, every time he got close to the top and then he had to go back down and start pushing again and this for all eternity. Um, this idea of um, Sisyphus uh, in Camus is is the idea of the human who is perfectly aligned with his fate <laughs> um, and doesn't um, strive for anything more beyond that. It's a fairly uh, challenging um, idea, I have to say. But then again, once again, I find that echo coming through in Viktor Frankl, where he says that uh, you know, the prisoners had a whole lot of suffering to get through. And actually, it was the ones who were able to just get on with the suffering, get on with the getting through the suffering, who had the uh, best chances of surviving their ordeal. The ones who tried to escape from it or retreat from it, or for some whatever reason of their own, they were not able to rise to the challenge. These were the ones who ended up dying. Um, more often anyway, of course, I mean, there are plenty of other reasons why people died in concentration camps. Um, he quotes Dostoevsky in this regard. Um, if anybody can tell me where this quote comes from, uh, I'll be grateful because I haven't managed to find it myself. Um, so I'm quoting Dostoevsky through Frankl. But anyway, the point is that Dostoevsky had one great dread, and that was um, not to be worthy of his sufferings, not to be able to live up to his sufferings, not to be strong enough to... Um, sustain his dignity, even in the face of suffering. Mm -hmm. Camus, understandably, um, was not a big fan of hope. Um, he rejected religious hope. He rejected the narratives of afterlife and salvation. Um, he rejected um, utopian hope, uh, the idea that uh, we can create a, a better future by reorganizing somehow our societies. Um, both of these, he felt, led to dictatorial attitudes, and quite frankly, I tend to agree with him on this point. But there is an unexpected twist in Viktor Frankl's narrative. Um, in the letter to a friend, um, he um, writes that actually it's impossible to live without hope. And I think this is where we begin to um, allow hope back into the picture. It's impossible to live without hope, basically, because hope is a quintessentially human experience. And I think um, when we start talking about eliminating hope, it, we're talking about eliminating one aspect of our experience. And I find that very difficult to square. Um, another um, reference from Gabriel Marcel, I mean, um, he talked about a strange hope. And in fact, Gabriel Marcel is interesting because um, he talked about two different kinds of hope. And I think this is really where uh, we begin to make some sense um, of hope. Um, he talked about, I hope that, as opposed to just simply, I hope. The idea of I hope that is the idea of living in the contingent world. This, this is the problem solving mind. Um, I hope that I'll get through to the end of this talk <laughs> um, alive. Um, but often, when we think about how we use the word hope um, in the language, in daily language, often we're not actually talking about hope at all. We're talking about fear. We're talking about despair. Um, I hope climate change doesn't really affect us too much. What are we expressing when we say that? Is that hope? I don't think so. I think often what we're doing is we're using the language in a certain way and then we are attributing a certain meaning to hope when actually this is not hope <laughs> this is uh if you like wishful thinking it's a different human experience but so marcel was actually interested in the what he called this absolute hope this hope in the realm of mystery um and because as we said, it's, um, it's a quintessentially human experience. And I would suggest um, from everything that I've uh, read so far that actually um, hope is a field of potential. 
hope is actually what allows us to act. When we're talking about hope, as in simple hope, not straining for the future, not trying to change outcomes, but just simply that experience that humans have when they act in a certain way and something comes up and warms us from within. That is the hope that I would like to uh, focus on this evening. So um, I think um, every time uh, anything gets mentioned in public about hope, um, Emily Dickinson gets quoted. Um, and I'm interested in um, what Emily Dickinson has to say. Um, she uh, actually um, called hope a strange invention. <laughs> Um, the poem that is often quoted uh, by her is, is, is a different one, and I'll come to that in a minute. But this idea of the strange invention, the strangeness of hope, um, is picked up also in uh, Gabriel Marcel. He also uh, spoke of a kind of a strange hope. Um, and so, but the poem that uh, Emily Dickinson is most famous for, the, her famous hope poem, which I'm going to quote to you because... Um, it's A, very beautiful. B, everybody talks about it all the time whenever hope is mentioned. But C, I really feel sometimes that uh, it's, um, it's not given its due credit. Um, in other words, it's often quoted as a kind of ornament to positive messages. Um, but frankly, there's nothing ornamental about Emily Dickinson. She is anything but ornamental. She is a sharp knife in the hands of a dangerous woman. That, that's poetry for her. She is uh, um, an extraordinary um, poet, I would say. So, um, Emily Dickinson, she uh, was a Victorian poetess. She was from North America of uh, Puritan descent, um, famously reclusive and considered an eccentric uh, by the people in her community. Um, she did not publish her work, in, or most of her work anyway, in her lifetime. Most of it got published after um, her death. And she um, writes about herself. Uh, she has this little kind of portrait of herself. I am small, like a wren, and my hair is bold, like the chestnut burr, and my eyes like the sherry in the glass that the guest leaves. I think that's a very striking image that she has of herself. So I'm going to read this poem to you first. And then perhaps um, I know that maybe there are some people here who are non-native speakers. I might sort of share my screen and uh, put it up for you to actually look at the text. Um, so here it goes. This is the poem um, in full. It's a very short poem. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea and yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Now, the words I would just like to, maybe I will just share this briefly. Um, okay. So here are the words of the poem, and I'll read it again. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land, and on the train strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. So what can we say about this poem? I think, um, apart from being a very beautiful poem, it's a simple poem, structurally. Um, the first thing that strikes me is that it is indicative of a song that never ceases. 
So she sees hope as something that is uh, never ending. And she mentions this in, in another poem too, the strange invention. It's uh, something that uh, is always there, it's always singing. But I think the quality about this poem and the quality about Emily Dickinson, which I would like to uh, bring up here, is that actually um, there's something very feminine about this energy that she is expressing in this poem. Hope is powerful, hope is um, airborne, it's wild, it's impervious to the elements, yet it brings us warmth in the dark. And as we've said with Viktor Frankl already, um, Hope is something that brought people warmth in the darkest of dark nights. I would suggest, since um, hope is often related to the myth of Pandora, that actually what we are looking at here is a different kind of Pandora, an earlier pre-Hellenic Pandora, a Pandora who is the gift giver. She is the, the, the Gaia figure, the, the maiden who represents Gaia, who comes and gives nourishment and uh, to the creatures, to, to sentient creatures, to nature. I would say that, um, in essence, what we're looking at here is that this unceasing song is a call. It's not an excuse. And again, I'm coming back to uh, my point earlier. Hope is a fundamental experience. It's a quintessentially human experience but it is calling us to action. It is not an excuse not to act. Let's check the time. Okay. So when we, um, and again, the, the, I'm here I'm coming back to um, Viktor Frankl for a moment because um, there's something that uh, he uh, suggests about um, the suffering that people uh, had to face in the camps. And we have to remember that he's coming at this from the point of view of the psychologist. He is a, he, he's obviously, he was there himself. He experienced uh, the ordeal himself, but he was also involved even uh, during his time in the camps in taking care of other people um, as a psychologist, as a doctor. And um, he was there also to observe. Uh, what was going on. He was um, making notes, as it were, um, on what he observed in the way people responded to, their, to the challenges of the camps. And what he um, says, which I think is very relevant to us, especially today, is that uh, if we are able to turn to face our challenges, the nature of the challenges will help us understand the nature of our task. So there is no quest for meaning in itself. Meaning is not uh, intended as, a, as an abstract ideal or idea which we need to look for. The meaning is found actually in looking at what is in front of us and taking that on board. By doing that, we understand the nature of our task. We understand what is the next step. So actually, um, when he says that uh, it's about what life expects from us, then he's actually suggesting that uh, the challenges that we face, and maybe we want to think about that in terms of today, uh, of what's happening in the world today, are actually our map and our compass to understanding how we need to act. So I'd like to come back uh, briefly to talk about um, the, uh, the point, the, the, the distinction between useful and unuseful ideas of hope, uh, which was the reason why I um, started thinking about hope and writing about hope um, in the first place. Um, and how, it, how all this sort of sits with the, the, the Buddhist perspective. Um, now, hope often is portrayed as um, um, entering into some kind of unholy alliance with fear. Um, and in doing that, um, unseating us from our equanimity, unseating us from our human dignity. Um, in the words of one um, famous monk, Buddhist monk, Tanisaro Bhikkhu, in an article all about change, which is available on his website, 
Um, he writes, how can we find genuine hope in the prospect of positive change if we can't fully rest in the results when they arrive? His perspective here is obviously, from the, 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 if there is a transcendental Buddhist perspective, is, the, is happiness that doesn't change, is this equanimity, is this sort of uh, um, release from uh, the, the problematic mind. We can take this a step further. In her famous book, When Things Fall Apart, Pema Chodron has a chapter, chapter seven, on hopelessness and death. And in there, she probably um, puts the case against hope um, most strongly, I would say, because um, for her, in, in, in her sort of perspective, um, it is important, in fact, to just completely give up on hope. And she advocates, actually, hopelessness. To give up hope that the pain and the insecurity can be exterminated, in her words, is to give up the quest for meaning. I think the other authors I've mentioned so far in the talk um, would probably agree with her on this point, and I think I do too. But the problems comes in for me when um, she talks about hopelessness as the only valid way of um, facing reality. And she writes, when we talk about hopelessness and death, we're talking about facing the facts. No escapism. We may still have addictions of all kinds, but we cease to believe in them as a gateway to happiness. In the monastery, she tells us um, monks renounced um, alcohol and sex, not because they were bad in themselves, but because they are um, babysitters that actually uh, save us from having to deal with our personal issues. Um, and in a similar vein, she talks about hope as an addiction. Um, uh, it's an addiction to the idea that uh, we can be saved or that we can, um, or something can save us. And I find Pema Chodron and the, the Buddhist message highly compelling. Um, and when I read her, even when I read this, reread this chapter recently, um, that old sort of sense of calling or something familiar in the teachings of the Dharma, uh, I felt it very strongly within me. Um, but I just can't get beyond the word, this word, hopelessness. When I think about hopelessness, I think about Viktor Frankl's description of a prisoner who has given up hope, who has basically stopped moving, who is lying in his own excretor, who is completely impervious to the blows and the yells that are rained down upon him to get him up and out into the frozen mud to do another day's labor. I think of Dante in the Inferno, the damned souls driven like starlings before the wind, without hope of respite or a reduction in their, in their sentence. So what do we say to people in these circumstances? I'll come back to the question I, I, I asked earlier. Um, of course, as individuals, we'll have to find our own answers to these questions. Um, so really, what, all I'm doing is putting questions out there um, uh, in the hope that uh, um, I can touch something in you. Um, but I'm thinking about Viktor Frankl's prisoner, the one who, um, in my mind, is this image of hopelessness. Um, and I'd like to suggest one thing, maybe, and I, I hope I'm not um, overstepping here. But maybe um, that prisoner had simply come to the end of his calling. And maybe his death, despite the um, horror of the appearances, was not a defeat in the end, but a final acceptance. The questions remain for us who stand witness and are still alive and continue to live on in our lives. We face many open questions all the time. So my question really to you then becomes, um, if I am alive now, what does my life expect of me? So, um, 
I think all of the authors that I've mentioned um, up to this point understand the importance of lived experience, that we need to um, live our experience, uh, that we need to find meaning in the living of that experience, um, that we need to be careful when we talk about hope because um, hope is very powerful. It's a very powerful potential that we have within us, but it's also dangerous because um, when we get into that trap of hoping for something, um, hoping for something to save us, <clears throat> then I agree with everything that uh, you know, we, we've, uh, we've said today. Then we are really setting ourselves up for disappointment. But when we think of hope, not as a problem solving technique, but um, as a way of entering into dialogue with the mystery, with our mystery, with what we don't know, with the potential of the future, then maybe we can begin to see that hope actually is a field of great potential, very great potential. So I don't really go along with um, the um, Extinction Rebellion slogan, uh, or one of them anyway, um, when hope dies, action begins. I find that disingenuous um, because Basically, in my understanding, that means I need to throw away a very important part of my humanity in order to act. So it just doesn't make sense to me. This really doesn't make sense to me. Um, through Viktor Frankl, through um, the Buddhists, through, I, I'm, I, I don't really have um, a Christian upbringing or background, so I'll allow Christians to speak for um, Christianity. Um, there is, all, there, there is often this um, emphasis on right action and right conduct. Victor Frankl, he talks about this a lot um, in his uh, book. Um, the Buddhists have no less than um, eight, uh, <laughs> eight paradigms of um, um, right action, the uh, Noble Eightfold Path. Um, and in a way, what we are doing when we remind ourselves of what constitutes right action um, is keeping alive that flame that is the strength behind our dignity. And again, as I said, Viktor Frankl features very prominently in this talk tonight. Um, I would suggest that uh, that human dignity is really what we stand to lose if we just give up on hope and embrace an idea of hopelessness. So um, I think what I'd like to do is come to um, our breakout session, uh, James and Eleanor. Um, so I'll just um, say a few words about this. So I think we, we decided that we were going to do three people in each group, right? Yeah, that correct? Yeah. We are doing three people, yes. Okay, so we're going to have um, 10 minutes for this. Um, now, what I'd like you to do um, is to... Um, it's not open conversation. We'll, we'll have a chance to have open conversation at the end of the talk. We'll have a, uh, um, a question and answer session. Um, what I'd like you to do is to um, address a question which I will give you um, and to do so um, in a way to uh, practice active listening. What I mean by that is um, members of the group, of each group, will take turns to talk for about a minute. Um, and the others will listen and will um, listen primarily for their own personal responses, what touches them um, about what the person sharing is saying. So the exercise, the practice is not about opinions and views and what we have learned from books and so on. Although that you know, has its place. Here, it really is about looking into our inner experience 
our even you might say our body experience and um, responding to how we are touched by what people are saying okay so focus on personal experience rather than what you have read or otherwise learned focus on what moves you not what you agree with or disagree with stay with the body experience rather than the mind's opinions and of course and this is you know for everybody if you don't want to uh, participate in this please feel free to sit it out if uh, when you get into a breakout room you decide that you would just like to listen please just tell your partners i'm going to listen i'm not going to talk that's absolutely fine okay um and since we're doing this as uh, groups of three, um, what I would suggest is, is it possible, James, to send reminders to people? Are you able to do that from your end? Yeah. Uh, yes. yes, we are. Yeah. You are, okay. So um, what I would suggest is that um, we can um, do, um, two, four, okay, well, uh, a minute each. So if uh, this is a lot of work for you, perhaps, but if you can send a reminder after a minute to change roles, okay, that would be great. Um, so we may actually see, see if this is going to be a bit shorter. So we're going to say the question is coming. I'm going to I'm leaving that until we're ready to go. Um, so if it's a, a minute per person, then a couple of minutes uh, of sharing. So maybe let's make this um, six minutes, not 10 since I had originally imagined larger groups. Okay, all right, all clear? <laughs> no problem. All right, good, so the question. So after, comes sorry, Robert, after the first minute, I send a message? Yes, maybe, I mean, um, after the first minute and a half, because people will have to sort of arrive in the group and get started. Um, but then after a minute and a half, um, you send a reminder and there are three people in each group. So that means you'll be sending two reminders. Okay, and then at the end of six minutes, then we will um, finish the, the breakout session. Okay. Um, okay, I think that's all. The question, so <laughs> the question is, um, I am alive. What is it that life expects of me? Over to you. Great. Oh, um, yeah, let's just go uh, straight into the breakout rooms. I should get the invitation very shortly. Well, everyone should be back more or less. Hope everyone had a uh, good breakout discussion. Um, yeah, before I'll, I hand it over to you, Robert, I just wanted yeah. to thank you for this uh, presentation that you gave in the past hour. It was... It was very interesting, very insightful. Uh, I loved how you brought so many disciplines together from psychology, prose and poetry to philosophy, you even brought up some of, personally, one of some of my favorite thinkers like Dostoevsky and Camus. Uh, and yeah, it really gave us really interesting insights on hope. So with that, I'll just uh, hand it over back to you, Robert. Okay, thank you, James. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I mean, uh, I could perhaps uh, um, uh, go on, but I, I don't think I will. I think I'll just um, say just a couple of words um, around something that's in the title uh, of the talk, um, just by way of context, perhaps, and maybe uh, to say a word or two about my my own interest in hope and why I'm actually sitting here tonight. Um, the uh, question of critical storytelling. Now, why did I call it critical storytelling? This word critical is a word that I fell in love with at university uh, while uh, reading The Wasteland uh, by Eliot. And it was um, investigating the origins of the word um, crisis, actually, that uh, I, I came to be really interested in this. Um, you know, a crisis, and, and Re Rebecca Solnit, um, she talks about this as well. She has this wonderful... Uh, book Hope in the Dark, where she um, you know, talks about this. And by the way, if anybody's interested in in the notes from my talk, there's the, with a, with a bibliography, I can put the PDF in the the chat, which you can download directly from the the chat. Um, so, okay, crisis. Now, according to Rebecca Solon, crisis was first um, used as a word by Hippocrates. Um, 
to, descri to describe that point in the progression of a disease at which the final prognosis is actually indeterminate. It could go either way. So it's that point of hanging in the balance. Um, and so when we look at it from that point of view, um, uh, crisis, it, it, I think, really bears thinking about. And the question becomes, are we living in a time of crisis or are we living in a time of apocalypse? Often we get the two things mixed up. If we're living in a time of apocalypse, it's the end of the world. If we're living in a time of crisis, things are hanging in the balance. And so when we have things hanging in the balance, it means that we also have potential. Things can go bad, but things can go well as well. And I think this is why um, ultimately hope is, uh, is becoming, I think anyway, um, a, a topic of great interest now. A lot of people are talking about hope. A lot of people are writing about hope. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy even has a whole section dedicated to hope, which is kind of really nice. It makes, it, makes my life a lot easier. <laughs> um, but, you know, it just goes to show that hope actually really is um, uh, an aspect of human experience that uh, is worth looking into. Um, the, the, the roots of this word actually um, can be traced back to Indo-European. Now, the... Um, sorry, I'm talking about crisis, not hope, because actually the interesting thing is that the word hope itself, um, we don't really know where it comes from, at least the German, the Germanic word that we use in English. Um, in Italian, obviously, it's a different word, and uh, in Greek, it's elpis, it has a different sort of... But the word hope, the English word hope, uh, doesn't really have much of a pedigree uh, beyond um, um, early it's Christian times. Um, so going back to the word crisis which is uh, what the word I've chosen to, um, you know, in combination with storytelling. Um, uh, philologists have traced it back to the Indo-European root skar, um, and which can be found in a Sanskrit word, apaskaras, which is excrement, waste, among other things. But, and in English, we find it in a word like discernment, the, the so part of the word. Um, uh, is um, said to de derive from this Indo-European root. So when we're talking about crisis, and this is why uh, I found it interesting in relation to Eliot, um, we're talking about sorting the good from the bad. We're talking about sifting. We're talking about uh, distinguishing uh, what is uh, worth keeping and what is not necessary. Um, this is um, obviously related to, you know, what, uh, today we refer to as critical, as the critic. And in fact, um, the specific context of my research into the word crisis was the name of his 1922 uh, poetry review, The Criterion, uh, which was specifically um, designed as a, as a place where he would um, give a voice to uh, young talent in poetry. And and he was literally sifting the good from the bad, the wheat from the chaff, as it were. So this idea of crisis, I think, is a very interesting one. And uh, we need to decide whether we are living in a time of crisis or in a time of apocalypse. Um, I think that's an important question. Um, the other thing uh, which would warrant a whole talk in itself and will probably constitute uh, very much a direction I'll go in next uh, in my thinking about hope is um, what I'm calling the body of hope. Um, I remember, I mean, my interest in hope goes back quite a long way in terms of personal experience. Um, and I remember writing one day in my diary in a, in a dark moment, it was a very difficult time of my life. Um, you know, at what point does the body of pain, at what point does the body of pain become a body of disease? So now, I'm talking about the body of hope, because ultimately, um, I think that uh, if we want to understand hope, uh, we need to also um, enter into um, dialogue with our bodies. And um, I think the whole question of somatic experience and trauma um, and how we relate to trauma um, is very, very relevant here. And um, everything that we learn from um, exploring our body experience is very, very um, pertinent to questions about hope. Um, apparently 70% of the information we have about ourselves comes from our bodies. 
Um, so it, it's really, you know, I think this is a really big topic, which, as I say, um, I won't go into that now, but it'll be uh, a part of future um, future studies. Um, and the last point, which is related to that, which I haven't really talked on much, I've mentioned the word agent. I mentioned it at the beginning of the talk, um, but I haven't really sort of um, uh, got to explore it in any, any great detail. This idea of agency. Um, and so if you remember at the beginning of the talk, the question was, um, you know, to what extent do we think or feel we are victims or agents in any given situation? And in, in particular now, I mean, when so much seems to be going on that is being decided for us rather than by us. Um, in relation to body awareness, um, the one of the, the you know the key words in you know for for trauma therapists and embodiment uh, practitioners is um, interoception. It's this uh, capacity to uh, look inside, look into our inner experience, and understand what the body is telling us. And it's interesting that the body, which is the vehicle of our external experience, is becoming a place of inner awareness. Um, and so um, the message that comes through from people who work with trauma um, is that this capacity to develop our awareness, um, often through uh, interception, i.e. an awareness of our bodily experience, um, is a way or a key, if you like, to um, unlocking agency. In other words, that awareness um, allows us to become um, cogn cognizant, cognizant, I'm not quite sure what the pronunciation is, um, of what is happening to us. Um, and it allows us to get to a, a place in our experience where we can feel that we are not victims anymore, but um, we are agents. And at that point, and this is coming back to Viktor Frankl, the, the, what he um, um, said about right conduct and right action, what the Buddhists say in the um, Eightfold Noble Path, the Noble Eightfold Path, sorry. Um, hope is something that we can nurture and nourish. Uh, and when we do that, then we enter into a field of immense possibility and immense resourcefulness. And with that, I think um, I can stop. So I'm going to upload the um, PDF in the chat box. Uh, where are you? Chat. Uh, we can um, also send the um, this bibliography when uh, we send out the recordings as well. We can put it even, even as a summary in the uh, YouTube video. Okay. Okay. Well, it's in the chat box now. Um, you'll get uh, all my notes and the, the, the bibli bibliography you'll find is actually uh, longer than <laughs> what I've actually used in the talk. But uh, I think I've just added the things that have kind of shaped my thinking um, for this talk. Okay, so uh, you'll have all that there. All right, so um, I'm done and uh, I'm, I'll just hand this over to um, um, all of you. Uh, uh, for the question and answer session. If anybody would like to share, um, if anybody would like to ask anything, um, um, and if anybody has um, something from the breakout groups uh, that you in particular would like to share with everybody, um, now's the time. Over to you. <laughs> So yeah, as I said uh, at the beginning of the session, to ask a question or make a contribution, if you could use either the raise your hand function, uh, which is in the reactions at the bottom of your screen. Otherwise, if you can't find it, physically raise your hand or even um, ask your question in the, through the chat. Who wants to go first? Uh, Alan. Thank you, Robert. That was a brilliant talk. Um, 
I would love if only if she doesn't mind Lena just to relate what she said in the breakout session because I thought it was wonderful but I, I do have a question it partly relates to that it's it does seem that we have hope and hope can be quite a personal thing and one can imagine lots of individuals with their individual hopes moving forward but not actually ad addressing what um, wider society, the whole of creation actually needs. That seems to come in through considering meaning, but perhaps you could address, well, in a way, individual hope and much wider hope for society, communities, even as wide as creation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, very interesting question. Um, the first thing that comes up for me uh, is that, yes, indeed, hope is an intensely personal experience. Um, and I have come to strongly feel that if we are going to make any sense at all of the wider problems, we need to uh, reassess our perception of what it means to be individuals. And that means to um, enrich our dialogue with our inner selves um, and to broaden our sense of our own unfolding mystery, um, which may even, I mean, it, the, the way we do that doesn't really matter, it seems to me. There are, there are 1,001 pathways um, to do that. Um, I love, for example, the fact that uh, Gabriel Marcel, um, he talks about hope the metaphysics of hope in a book which is entitled um, um, Homo Viator uh, in an introduction to the metaphysics of hope. Homo Viator in Latin is the itinerant man. So um, in a sense that touches the question that Pema Chodron touches as well in, in her book, namely that um, what we need to do is to come into touch with that sense that we are in motion, that we are itinerants, that, uh, that sense that we are able to live um, a thriving and successful existence uh, without striving for um, a stability or a certainty about the future. And I and think this is really the key. Um, it's not about outcomes. Hope is not about outcomes, or hope as I intend it, is not about outcomes or results. It's about learning how to be with ourselves and how to uh, deal with the contingent issues that are in front of us. Um, and learning how to use those issues, those contingent issues, as a map and a compass towards right action and right conduct. I think if we can do that for ourselves and through uh, the work um, of, you know, uh, for example, what we're doing this evening with the party center, I think this is why it's so important what, what this, this event actually is. Through these events coming together and sharing uh, our experience of what it means to be alive and human. Well, I think we're already, um, going a long way to addressing uh, the wider problem. There are plenty of practical issues, of, of course. I mean, you know, uh, just recently we had a talk by Colin Tudge, um, you know, a, a few talks by Colin Tudge and guests um, addressing uh, the problem of, uh, you know, and, and agriculture and re re reorganizing society. Um, of course, the, these, are, these are discussions that need to happen as well. But I, I, I feel that um, from our personal perspective, it's really important that, um, A, we um, always endeavour to enrich our experience of ourselves, our inner selves. Um, and B, we um, allow that enrichment process to bring us into contact with others. I hope that... Uh, 
answers your question or at least addresses the question anyway. I'm not sure. it, does, it does very much. That's a lovely answer. And that's plenty for me to, to think about, consider. Thank you. That's brilliant. Pleasure. <laughs> Um, thank you for that, Alan. And uh, yeah, so you did mean, Lena, did you want to bring in something? There is no pressure. You don't have to if you don't want to. I uh, don't know if you wanted to share what you've uh, said in the breakout room. Well, I was saying that um, I was saying that I believe that life is expecting. It's like life is manifesting through us. This is what I feel. And let's say what we're fundamentally are. We're not able to be at first because of all the programming and all the, you know, our childhood society, blah, 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 blah. And every time I go through something difficult and I do a practice and I do that with the clients that I have, it's always, it seems to me, and maybe I'm not, but this is what I've discovered from life because he was saying, you know, let's talk about your experience of, of what it is. It's so in French, because I'm French Canadian, so my mother tongue is French. There, I have a saying in my practice, I say, I'll say it in French for those of you, and then I'll translate. Ce que je vis en conscience, je n'ai pas à vivre en souffrance. So what I live consciously, I don't have to, to suffer through it. What I've come to realize is that the events that happen is like that clash of that call that life is wanting to manifest itself through us. And that thing that prevents me from, from being that, and the events reveal what I have to bring into consciousness. So it's this path all the time. And the, the place where, where hope has its place in my life is in the sense that, not, not that I'm blindly saying, okay, I hope. I, while I do that work, that is difficult to have that shift into consciousness from what is happening that is making me suffer through what I have to bring into consciousness. Hope is there for me, is vital to me because I know I will overcome it. I know I will get something in my life. So far, every time I've been able to put into consciousness what it, the event meant or the circumstance, and even, even the COVID right now, on it, it has an impact on humanity, but it also have a very, has a very different impact depending on the person where that person is in, its, in his, his or her life. And it's revealing something. So to me, hope is um, is it is a vital ingredient into that coming and you know like thriving because life life wants us to thrive everything thrives so why not us so it's always that you know that I see how I manifest who I am and I believe that I I am more and more who I am and I feel that this is how I'm most useful to humanity. And when you can be this, you feel like you want other people to be this too. So I always say, this is how I, I, um, you know, I will never um, go in the streets and uh, like manifest for peace. I always say, I take care of my own inner peace. And through that, this is how I manifest peace. Because if you're peaceful, you want, you don't feel like, you know, giving a hard time to other people. So the more you are who you are, the more you are willing to let other, or you, you feel like enticing other people to be who they are. And that's how I think, you know, hope has its place there. So I really, I just want to take the opportunity to say, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. So that's what, that's what I meant by, uh, Thank you. Thank you. you know, it was good. So I don't know what you think about this, but uh, I'd be curious to know your, uh, or if other people have uh, other questions, that's great. I think we'll go to the other people. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Lena, for sharing. Um, just uh, as first come, first serve, I think Shelley had her uh, hand up. Thank you. Oh, thank you, uh, Robert, for such an inspiring but also provoking uh, talk. Um, if it's okay, I would like to share something uh, from the group, but then also to uh, to to bring up a question. Um, so this um, is is relevant also to it's connected to what Lena just said. I like that element of revealing because I feel that that um, like <laughs> that that word Lena like really puts into context what I what I sense that happened in our breakup room um, that um, um, Katie said so so beautifully that um, 
Um, I hope it's okay that I'm sharing, Katie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, that life is expecting her to give, but then to give more. And this is beyond what she's um, had or expected or, or paid attention to before. Um, and I feel that, that, um, that that element of revealing is that dot of light in the darkness, that it reveals something that we're not clear that is possible, that it is not clear that actually we're, we're asked for, that it is not obvious in a way. And, and then it, it made me realize that actually hope is energy mm. in that sense. And so I really loved what you said earlier that hope is a field of potential and, and specifically I like that that leads into an action. Uh, because for me personally, I think that's what's uh, most important, especially now. Uh, wise action, compassionate action, um, insightful action, inspired action. Um, so if hope is a field of of, of potentiality that leads to action. I'm curious if you can say a little bit more about what you've kind of like put out there that the, the um, free will is not actually the question. So if you can kind of like bring this up together, I'm sorry for making your life complicated. <laughs> um, so hope is a, is a field of potential that leads into the right action and so in that regard, why, why is free will not the, the question that we need to ask ourselves? I think um, when I think of free, free will, um, I think of I'm free to do what I want. Um, and in a way, it, it, for me, it feels like... Um, it doesn't really matter whether my action is meaningful or not. Um, when I think about action arising from hope in the sort of circumstances which we have discussed so far uh, to this evening, I'm thinking about right action. In other words, the, you know, the appropriate action, what comes up as a result of what is facing us and what is challenging us, um, comes up as a result of what we love. Um, and I think that's a very different, it, it has a different feel to it. And it, it, for me, um, the fact itself of whether or not I am free to do what I want is um, academic. Um, uh, because there are situations when I am free to do what I want, there are situations when I'm not free to do what I want. And, I, and you know, I come, I come back to that um, sort of problem that I had at you know, at university, this, you know, the story that you know well, that, um, you know, the head of department comes to me and says, so what did you think about the course on free will and determination? I said, well, it sounds like, you know, two people arguing um, the same thing in different words. For me, it was, it didn't really make any sense. But when we talk about, you know, the, um, the action that arises out of um, the field of potential, then we're talking about something which is in relation to uh, the environment, it's in relation to the situation, it's in relation to um, the, uh, the call, the calling, you know. Um, if it's to save um, habitats or to save lives or to help others or even just to share, you know, our insights, uh, rather like we're doing this evening, if that's the calling, then it seems to me that is right action. Um, and I don't need to kind of worry too much about whether or not, you know, that comes out of <laughs> uh, some kind of philosophical free will. Um, I don't know. I mean, that, that's really kind of what comes up for me. Uh, um, does that answer, answer the question anyway? Do I sort of address the question at all? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, mm. absolutely. I think it's, um, it's bringing into light the same um line of thinking of of hope as a delusion of hope as an escapism as a, hope mm. as a as a way of actually escaping our problems uh mm. which free will is kind of like oh 
excuse my French, fuck it, I'm just gonna do whatever I want. Um, and more like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to look into the challenge that I have and what are the potential that exists from, from that um, and, and choose, choose my action from that. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Shelley, for that. Uh, now we are getting a bit late, so maybe we'll take one more question. Is that okay, Robert? Uh, as you wish. If, um, I'm, I'm happy to stay here if you want to stay here, or I'm happy to close if you want to close. We'll see. Yeah, uh, we'll see. How, as, as you feel. See how late we get after the first question. Uh, Oliver. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Robert. Good to see you, Oliver. <laughs> Good to see you too. Um, yeah, really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed your talk. I've been looking forward to it all day. Um, lots of names, lots of people I like, like to hear and spend a lot of time with. Um, academics uh, out of the way, first of all. I think the Dostoevsky quote is from the House of the Dead. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, the, and it ties in with the Frankel because it's the, the Siberian death camp, isn't it? Or Siberian gulag. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that's where it's from. I'm reading his autobiography at the moment. I think I, told, I might have told you. It's um, amazing, amazing story and definitely related to so much that you're talking about. Um, I'm really interested in your next, where your thinking's going with this. And so, because um, I know you know my... Um, major interest in body and bodily transformation. So, and I liked how you linked this with trauma and crisis. I really like this sort of philological, etymological exploration or mapping out that you did there at the end and the relation. Um, so, a body of hope, mm. something about that kind of piques my interest, definitely. And I don't really necessarily have a, have a, quest, a solid question as such. I'm just, I'm just, just I'll just go on. So, um, but there's something about trauma being a wound, isn't there? I mean, if there's, I'm sure there's psychotherapists and people in the room, analysts, and tra trauma being a wound, and wounds are held in the body. So, um, and one of the symptoms of trauma, trauma is that we become helpless when we've ex had excessive trauma we become helpless and it's trapped in our bodies so so working through that in a bodily sense seems so important so then that's the sort of negative side so then for me the interest there is where you're talking about a body of hope so what's the a body free from trauma and I think that opens up then to the first question I'm sorry I didn't catch the name of the first person who asked the question but to, to expanding that about out of the individual because as, as a body we're not an isolated thing as a thinking thing we can tend to get park ourselves off somehow and that's how our culture western culture at least let's say i don't like the word western has, has parked us off but our bodies are intersubjective there's, there's no there's no possibility of them not to be interrelated and intertwined and interweaved in all these different ways so for me that then opens it up into this intersubjective dimension and and yep. the body of earth i would say and so then I'd say necessarily, you know, to be an ecological self, I mean, that's where a body of hope seems to go directly into your interests of, of ecological yeah. self, I think. So, so I'm really fascinated. I'm sure we'll talk, I'm sure we'll yeah. talk more about all of that because, you know, I'm, I'm interested in these things at the moment as well. So it may be piquing my interest because I have that in my, yeah. in my back, mm -hmm. background, but um, yeah, really great. Um, my one question, if I was to throw one quick question out after all that, um, I won't ask you what a body of hope looks like because that's a really hard, tough question. <laughs> but is hope simply then a way to keep the door to possibility open, to keep the openness mm -hmm. to life and to possibility? And I think I felt that when asked, am I alive? What is it life expects from me? I feel like I hear life asking something of me, which yeah. then necessarily opens me somehow through I that think question. I mean, we started off this talk talking about uh, dualities. Um, 
and uh, often the trap is, um, and I mentioned you know, the, the trap of the you know the level one entry philosophy course at university, is to sort of try and sort of say that you know, it's either this or that. But mm -hmm. um, really, I think what we're talking about is open questions, open questioning, yeah. and the open questioning is that capacity also to hold uh, to hold the opposites rather than trying to do something with them, um, mm -hmm. and. So I like the I, I like the image of the field when I talk about you know, the field of potential. Um, uh, it's, it's because it is open. It's an open field of potential, and you know, it's potential. In other words, it's you know, it, it contains um, every outcome and it, it contains everything that could possibly happen in a way. Um, but we are not trying to control that. We're not trying to reach forward and control the outcome. We're trying to just you know, um, attend to uh, where we stand in that field of potential. Mm. Mm. And it really, it really kind of, you know, it's this, the gift of paradox, actually, you know, I, I was just, uh, before we started the talk, I was just looking again at, at the way of paradox by Cyprian Smith on the uh, teachings of Meister Eckhart. Um, it's just this, this sort of um, ability to hold opposites together in, in one's consciousness and to sit with them. Um, instead of um, needing to reach for the conclusion all the time. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is really, really, uh, you know, where a lot of really, really good work, I mean, you know, you tell me, a lot of great work is done in, in trauma therapy, in psychotherapy. Um, you know, it, it's, it's about open questions. It's not about, mm -hmm. uh, so, not so much, I'd say, about solutions. Mm -hmm. Or well, maybe we should say it's just, if it's a seventy percent open questions and thirty percent solutions. Mm. Well, um, thank you, Oliver. Thank you. For this, uh, for this reflection it was very, very interesting. Um, and we are, uh, I guess, a bit late now, so I guess we should start uh, closing this session, unfortunately. And I apologize for all of those who wanted to ask questions, but they couldn't. Um, Robert, do you have any any closing insights? Any closing remarks? Um, well, in a, in a word, no. I think in a, it really, we, I mean, we've sort of covered everything that we can cover. Um, I just uh, just to say thank you, really, um, and uh, you know, um, from from inside the fishbowl of being the speaker. It it, uh, it really feels like complete and utter chaos. What I um, said to you, um, but clearly people have managed to get something out of it. So <laughs> I think I'm sort of I'm I'm content. <laughs> <laughs> oh great! Well, I mean, it was perfectly clear to me, and I hope that it was to uh, everyone else. So thank you again once more, Robert, for your presentation. It was great to thank have you. you with us and thank you everyone for uh, joining us today it's been a really great session yeah. uh now before we go i'd just like to give you a few updates I invite you to a few uh party center events that are upcoming before we join again uh, next time uh first of all uh this week we had a very special event uh starting that is running over three months uh, which is called e Epistemic Justice, uh, a, a series curated and presented by Dr. Baba Buntu. Uh, this program started on the 12th and it's, um, it, it, was, it will be on Wednesdays, I think, uh, and it's rooted in African worldviews uh, where we explore different aspects of history that have had devastating impact in human development. Rather than providing answers and solutions to these problems, this series attempts to seek a common thinking and encourage a multidisciplinary approach to transformation. Uh, this event covers 12 key concepts. Uh, we had the first one, which was on skin, uh, part of the May uh, series that focused on the physical. Uh, next one will be on presence and then will be representation. Uh, the next month, we'll be looking at the cognitive. Uh, so, for example, violence, economy, and leadership. Uh, then we'll look at the social sphere, such as family, youth, and gender. And finally, the metaphysical uh, with spirit, unity, and balance. Something a bit different uh, that we've been doing, but it is very exciting. The first session was fantastic. So I do invite you to uh, join us at this event. 
Uh, and finally, I'd just like to invite you to our main event of the summer entitled, What is Consciousness? Uh, and this event uh, will run between the 5th and 27th of June on weekends, where, as the title suggests, we'll be looking at consciousness, not only from a neurophysical perspective, but also from a psychological, philosophical and human perspective. For this event, we have the honor of having the lineup that includes Richard Baker Rossi, uh, Valerie Hardcastle, Basil Hailey, Bernardo Kastrup, Gary Lachman, Ian McGochris, Roderick Main, Pavel Pilkanen, Beverly Zabriskie, all chaired and curated by our director here at the Paris Center, Santina Sabadini. Um, as always, you can contact us uh, through our website where we'll have all these updates for our events. There's something not quite ready, but very exciting happening in the summer. So check that on the website uh, to contact us again. We have a contact us section or you can just visit our Facebook or YouTube page or just send us an email directly uh, to contact me, james at parcenter.com or to contact Eleanor, Eleanor at parcenter.com. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you again, Robert. And we'll see you again soon here at the Park Center. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.